I'm on. Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover. I'm a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, and I'm the lead architect now for Windows Server and for the System Center Data Center products. And I'm known for my work in PowerShell, which is obviously why you invited me. Uh, so I have, we have a choice. You have a choice. I can give one of two talks. First is around Gia. Gia is just enough administration. It's a PowerShell toolkit for managing a post Snowden world. That's the shorter talk. Um, very cool stuff. Um, and it's also, I, I got a kind of level 200 talk and then a level 400 talk that talks about, say, the constrained run spaces work. And then the other talk uh, I have is uh, around the Monad Manifesto. <clears throat> and you know what it was, you know what we were trying to do, kind of a history of PowerShell, and then also what it means going forward, where I think we've done okay and where I think we have going forward. So there's your choices. So how many people would like to hear about Gia? Okay, and how many for uh, Monad Manifesto? Okay, Monad Manifesto gets it. Okay, because I can't do both, sorry. Let's see. Let's see if this is going to work. All right. Okay. So history. Um, I joined Microsoft in 1999 and immediately was pushing for administrative automation. You know, we need command line interfaces uh, and in particular Unix tools, right? I was very familiar with that. I've got a deep Unix background and I just knew that this GUI stuff was not going to work. Okay. It wasn't going to scale. Uh, so I encountered some cultural pushback. Now, uh, one senior executive said to me, exactly what part of, now notice I, I took out the F word here, but when he said it, there was an F word here. Which part of Windows is confusing you? Um, so that was okay. So then, <coughs> I remember the day like it was yesterday. I finally prevailed. I finally talked to this <coughs> one executive made a passion plea, got very reasonable, explained everything, and she got it. She figured it out. Like, oh, I get it. Ah, oh, makes so much sense. I'm in. Oh, yeah, great. She says, which 10? I said, I'm sorry? She said, well, which 10? I said, I don't, I'm, I'm, which 10 what? She said, well, which 10 commands should we do? I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be a long road to hold. And it's like, no, we got to do, we got to do, commands for everything. She says, yeah, 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 but we've got to start somewhere. So pick the 10 we're going to do. So anyway, very difficult and long process. Uh, so eventually, I fought in for uh, getting power, sh sorry, getting the, uh, we call, had a product called Services for Unix. It was all the Unix shells and all the Unix utilities. And I came that close to getting it installed in Windows. Right? And at the very last moment, they said, hey, we can't be 100% sure that this is pure IP clean. And if there's any chance that somebody out there is saying, ah, that is my line of code, uh, they have the possibility of saying, you have to stop shipping Windows. So the risk of that was so great, they said, no, we cannot include it in Windows, but we can make it a free download. And so that's what we did. So problem solved, right? Got Unix utilities on Windows. Eh, did not work at all. It didn't help anything. It was completely useless. Uh, and why was that? And the answer is this distinction between a document and an API-oriented operating system. Okay? So Unix is a document-oriented uh, operating system. Everything's a document, right? So <laughs> literally, if you can edit a file and you can restart a process, you can manage everything in Unix. In fact, all Unix products are just fancy ways, all Unix management products are just fancy ways of editing files and restarting processes. That's it. I don't know why they charge so much money for it. Now, on the other hand, right, and so by the way, in this world, that's why awk, grep, and sed are management tools. I mean, they literally are, right? Etsy groups, you know, uh, passwords, uh, Etsy hosts, go in there, modify that stuff. Okay. Um, however, Windows is an API-oriented operating system, right? So, awk didn't work against WMI. 
grep didn't work against Active Directory, sed didn't work against the registry. We have APIs, we have subsystems. Now there's reasons for one, reasons for the other, sort of doesn't matter. This is the way the world is. They pay me not to deal with the way the world ought to be, but rather to manage the world as it is. So I couldn't go in there and say, hey, change everything to a document. It's like, I gotta deal with this world. And this is why the Unix tools didn't work. And by the way, it's also why most of the Unix tools continue not to work on, on Windows. Now there's one exception to this which gives people false sense of progress. There's a one uh, Windows subsystem which is actually quite important and is document oriented, and that's IIS. So a lot of the guys, Unix managing tools, will often uh, take their tools, get them running on Windows, are able to do a good job of managing IIS and say, I manage IIS, or I manage Windows. And it's like, no, that ain't going anywhere. I've, <laughs> I've stepped on this rake. You're not going anywhere. Anyway, so then I said, okay, well, we'll got this great tool, uh, these great tools, now all we need to do is to feed it command line interfaces. So I invested four million dollars, four million dollars, to, for contractors to write me 60 command line interfaces. At the end of the day, that was really just a drop in the bucket. Very small coverage, right? Uh, but I did that. Then what I did was I invested, I, I had another problem at the time, and that was WMI. Okay? The problem with WMI was it didn't have a good value proposition. We'd go to people and say, hey, write a WMI provider. At the time, it was hard as hell to write a WMI provider. But we'd say, hey, write a WMI provider, and then what? And then they'd say, oh, well, if you write a WMI provider, then system management companies like Tivoli can manage you. Only problem with that was I had just come from Tivoli where this was my job and I knew exactly what coverage I gave to WMI which was crap because I didn't think it was going anywhere so it was just checkbox item. So I said, listen, that's not real. <laughs> There's no value there. And I said, look, if someone does the work to generate a WMI provider, they need to get some value from it. So let's give them a command line interface. So we did WMIC. Now at the time, the program manager said, oh, that's great, we'll just, um, we'll just write a bunch of scripts a VB scripts to call the individual providers. I said, no, 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 my friends, that won't work. I need an engine that I give metadata to, and it then drives the WMI. And they said, why? No, this will be easier. I said, I don't care whether it's easier for you. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with doing the right architecture. And they said, why are you being such a butthead about this? I said, okay, well, here, there's two answers. One is, you're going to write the scripts, but how's that going to help the WMI provider that hasn't been written? Right? They haven't been written yet, so they have to be able to do this. And it's not about them writing the scripts, it's about them using our engine. But the real answer is, because we had gone through at Microsoft just time and time and time again, where the developers had written all this great code, only to see it thrown away, because you turn it over to the test organization, and the test organization said, I, I can't uh, test that, so throw it away. Literally, throw it away. There's an amazing set of features in the dustbin somewhere because some test organization said, I don't have the bandwidth to, to test this. And so I said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to write my engine and we're going to test that engine once and then I'm going to give it metadata and I'm going to avoid my test organization because I'm not testing the metadata and I just go, 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 go. And so that's what we did. And so, so I spent $60,000, remember, I spent $4 million to get 60 commandlets. I spent $60,000 to get the WMI engine. And then one Christmas vacation, I just cranked out a bunch of this metadata and generated 72 commands on WMIC. So $60,000 and my Christmas vacation gave me more than these $4 million in contractors. So I said, well, that, that, there's something there. The next I said is, boy, this seems like a really powerful thing. If I invest more, in fact, I invested, I think it was $20,000 more, I increased the capabilities of the engine, and every capability I put into the engine, every single one of my commandlets got more powerful. I said, boy, I'm really on to something here. This is, this is, an, this is an important discovery. So, again, WMIC had this common processing engine. It consumed metadata to make WMI classes into command line interfaces. Uh, 
And in fact, the way this worked was I had XML. I'd get the WMI object, I'd turn it into XML, and then I had these XSLT transforms that I would output it as a list or select a set of properties and output it as a table, et cetera. Okay? In fact, in fact, I had pipelines of XSLT. In fact, if you go look there, it's pretty hard because it's, it's, it's there, but it's not well documented, and actually it doesn't work very well. But what you can do is you can have an XSLT transform to then transform it into something and pipe that into another XSLT transform and then in another and another. Okay? And so that was the idea. And, and basically, I ran out of time and, and money to, to go farther on this. But this idea of XSLT transforms of XML was very interesting to me. So that was, all, that was all great. That was going well. Uh, but I had this problem. And the problem was it still was very, very difficult to write these WMI providers. At the time, the WMI coverage was very difficult. R difficult to get, difficult to do. But what I discovered it through the WMIC, WMIC development was this phenomenon here. Right? If you took dev and test cost and compared it against the number of functions you were going to deliver, the original contractors did a little bit of, of uh, 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 kind of core work, but then for every command they developed, I had this very almost linear cost associated with it, right? So said this way, the uh, cost to get me my 60th commandlet was roughly the same cost to get my 6th. And my 600th would have cost the same amount. So it was very, very expensive and very, very expensive. Now with WMIC, however, I invested in an engine that gave me no commandlets. But then I was able to write these w this metadata and very, very inexpensively get a ton of them. Okay? And again, because this is all based upon this engine, I was able to invest in the engine and get a ton more functions uh, without any additional work in the commandlets. And this was the heart of the economics that of, of what became PowerShell. Right? So PowerShell's got some great technology, but the true miracle, in my view, the true miracle of PowerShell is the economics, right? That developers are able to do so little work and get so much great value out of it. Okay? So we'll see this chart again. Okay, so fast forward a while. So, you know, my job when I came into the company was as uh, the lead architect for all of Windows uh, management products, management technologies and products. So I went off and I was, you know, I did this work, but I was doing a, a bunch of other things. I, I led the, the uh, SCOM acquisition, or the technology that became SCOM. Anyway, at the time, there's this big effort around .NET, 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 .NET. And every time I went to see Bill Gates, he just beat me up about this .NET. You got to get on .NET. You got to get on .NET. You got to get on .NET. I'd like, Bill, you know, my hair's on fire trying to solve this mess. And I swear to God, .NET does not look like a bucket of water to me. Get on .NET. Get on .NET. And it's like, okay, so that's Bill's foot was right up my ass on this .NET thing. Anyway, so he just kept on this. And I thought, well, okay, look, smart guy. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't think I'm missing something, but maybe I'm missing something. So I'll go experiment with this .NET. And what I did was I thought, well, okay, here's what I'll do. Um, I will rewrite WMIC, and I'll take that idea of the XML pipelines, and I'll go execute that, right? I'll uh, fully, you know, I mentioned I ran out of time and budget. I'll go implement that myself. I'll do these pipelines of XML things and have XSLT transforms. That was a truly horrible idea. XSLT is just, anyone ever used XSLT? Yeah, yeah, these guys know that was never gonna work. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. I kept thinking it was like awk. If you've, anybody, how many people have a Unix background? Okay, just a few. Well, like awk, like, uh, you know, you gotta struggle through awk, but then once you get th your head through the knot hole, like, oh, that's how it works, then it's pretty simple. So I kept thinking XSLT was gonna be like that. I never got my head through that knot hole. And it was just hideous. Anyway, but as I, as I was doing this, I discovered that .NET had reflection. And the reflection APIs gave me about 70% of what I needed out of a management interface, out of what WMI was getting me, but Bill G's foot. Bill G was not going kicking everyone's ass to go implement WMI, but he was kicking everyone's ass to go implement .NET. And so I thought to myself, hey, wait a second. If I go do that WMIC, where I was able to get this fantastic economic power because of this uniform object interface, and do it on .NET instead of WMI, 
man, I can just get fantastic coverage because this WMI, I'm having a hard time getting people to implement it. By the way, now we have WMI v2. It's actually pretty simple. But back then, it was hideously hard. And so that was how we got there. So that became the, the genesis. Now, as I thought about it, so I started on PowerShell, and I started to do a deep rethink of the whole process. And uh, you know, I like to describe the, the, the compositional model as this, A pipe to B, pipe to C. This is the classic Unix model, right? And I asked myself, I, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's very important to give yourself permission to ask dumb questions. Really, just ask dumb questions. Somebody's there, and, and you feel like a dope asking the question, but you just ask this, and all of a sudden people are like, oh, that's a good question. Anyway, so I gave myself permission to ask the dumb question, why do people do this? And I did deep thinking about this, right? Like, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And it hit me. They do A pipe to B pipe to C because A doesn't do what you want it to do. If it did, you just type A. So at some point it's like, duh, okay, that's kind of obvious, right? <coughs> dumb question, dumb, dumb answer to a dumb question. But I said, then I said, well, wait a second. Well, why doesn't A do what you want it to do? And that's where it got interesting. Because there's two answers. Now the facile answer is the Unix answer. The Unix answer will say, that's the model. The model is that we have small tools that do one thing well, and then you put stitch them together to solve complex problems. Okay, you Microsoft guys, you get it all wrong. You're all in this scenario, scenario, scenario. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna understand your scenario. So I'm gonna come, I got a whiteboard or a notepad, and I'm gonna watch what you do, I'm gonna ask you some questions, I'm gonna ask you some questions about him, I'm gonna see what all that is, and then I get your scenario. And so I leave, and I'm gonna write this all down, and then I'm gonna do the specs, and three years later, I'm gonna give you a tool to meet your scenario. Of course, 20 minutes after I left the office, your scenario changed, right? This guy said, what the hell are you doing it that way for? Or he had this inspiration, or the requirements changed, or your boss came in and they have a different philosophy of doing things. Scenarios change all the time. Well, here I give you this great tool that solves the scenario you had three years ago, and you say, well, that doesn't help me. And my response is, great, tell me what your new scenario is. Hang in there, just hold your breath for another year or two, and I'll give you a new one. We'll repeat this year after year. So you, you Windows guys just don't get it. You have a small toolkit, toolkit of small objects, you compose them together, 20 minutes later when your thing changes, instead of A pipe to B pipe to C, you do A pipe to B pipe to D, and you solve it immediately. So that's the traditional answer. That's a great answer, that's not the key answer. The key answer is why doesn't A do what you want it to do? It's because A tightly binds three separate steps into one step. Okay? A gets a set of objects, it processes those objects, and it outputs those objects as text. So when we say, and this is the heart of PowerShell, this is the heart, this is the heart, heart, heart of it. When we say A doesn't do what we want it to do, what we're really saying is that I didn't get the right objects, or I didn't process the objects the way I wanted to, or I didn't output the objects as text the way I wanted to. So piping things to B and C is really the process of taking the text output and trying to reverse engineer your way back to do one of those steps differently. That's what's really going on, right? That's the deep answer. And so PowerShell, I just said, hey, let's put the pipeline there. And instead of, of manipulating text, which is this low-class thing, right? Text, so I call it prayer-based parsing, right? Cut off the first three, is three, four, three, four, 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 four lines, cut off the first four lines, go over 27 columns, is it 26? Is that a tab? Oh shit, it's a tab. Um, you know, it's all this prayer-based parsing. And it's amazing that the Unix guys actually get this working because it's just so fundamentally broken. Um, but they do, they do. It's fragile as hell, but they kind of get by. But anyway, so instead, well, instead of all that crap, right, where you have to be, anybody, anybody consider themselves a regex expert? 
Yeah, no, I use regexes all the time. I can't remember them for anything, for anything. They're horrible. But you have to become a regular expression expert to get this stuff done. And so we say, well, let's just have the pipeline here and let's manipulate the objects. And the object's actually simple, right? Some people think, ooh, PowerShell objects complex. It's like, no, PowerShell objects equals simple because this is very easy to manipulate. And then you only output text when you want text. So this is the heart. This is the big idea. This is the... This is, this is why they, they associate me with the name PowerShell, because I came up with this idea. Okay, so then <coughs> we uh, tried to do this new administration model. Let's see, where are we here? Okay, so basically PowerShell was a deconstruction of the, of the basic Unix model. Okay, remember, I highlighted that the Unix model, Unix tools don't work for us. But it's a, actually a very, very powerful model, right? So you got an interactive shell, you got commands, you have text manipulation utilities, and then you have GUIs and command line interfaces. So basically what I did was I want to say, hey, I'm going to deconstruct that model, and then I'm going to focus very heavily on, on value and economics, right? I like to say that, you know, we're all technologists, right? We love technology, the latest and greatest stuff, cool whiz bang. But technology that matters, Technology that changes the world is technology that yields a substantial economic difference. So I knew that, and I focused in on that, and I just reimagined the whole thing for an API-oriented system. And that became the Monad Manifesto. Now at the time, um, we were developing this as part of, uh, <laughs> so what had happened was, there was a, there was a team, I had these ideas, I was doing that kind of prototyping myself, just experimenting with .NET when I had the insight. But I didn't go too much farther after that. I just had the idea. When I found a team who had been funded to port K-Shell to Windows. And remember I mentioned that we couldn't get these tools in box because uh, of IP concerns. So they were going to do a complete clean room version of K-Shell and get it running on, on Windows. And I said, don't bother. It's not going to help. Instead, do this. And they said, what? And so I explained it to them. And they said, what? And so I explained hour after hour. And they said, what? I said, you know what? Just go away. <laughs> Just go away. Come back later. And so I spent a month, and I wrote a 10,000-line demo. And I said, OK, let's talk again. I explained it. And they said, what? I said, here, let me show you. And I showed it to them, and their eyes got big. And they said, well, how about this? And I showed it to them. And they said, how about this? And I showed it to him. And basically, the vast majority of what you now know as PowerShell was implemented in those 10,000 lines of code. And they got it. And they said, of course, this is what we must do. And so we did that. And at the time, the project was being done in India. Okay, So we had a bunch of the people, uh, program managers in Redmond, but all the developers and testers in India. Well, if you ever tried to do work with India, but it's difficult. <laughs> It's a real challenge. It's, for us, it's 12 and a half hours time difference, 12 and a half hours. So that just begins with the weirdness. And they got a weird social structure, et cetera. This is all weird. Anyway, so what we had heard was, oh, the way you have to be successful is you got to document everything. So at some point, we had a 165-page uh, uh, help document, most of which never got implemented. But you'll see actually a bunch of vestiges in PowerShell. You should really look at, at get help, and you'll see some amazing things in there. Many of them are not implemented, but they came uh, from this 165-page document. And it's like, okay, well, that, that's not working either. But I felt the need, and oh, sorry, so my, my, my India guys didn't know Windows, they sort of didn't understand, they knew some Linux, but they didn't understand the administrative model. They didn't know .NET, and then I come up with these crazy ideas, it was just not working. So I thought was, okay, I gotta produce a document that helps them get their head through the knothole, that they get what we do. And that's what this Monad Manifesto did. And the key thing was that it flew at the right level between specific and vague. Okay? It was, no, I'm serious. <laughs> it's not a joke. It was specific. You know what it's saying, but then it's vague on the details. Now, the vagueness turned out to be the power because it gave the individuals the freedom to go say, oh, I get what we're trying to accomplish. Here's the way we can go do it. And so, again, I like to highlight that I get way too much credit for PowerShell. Okay, I came up with the basic ideas. But most of the things that you know and love and use every day 
were the inspiration of individual team members on the, on the team, right? And the document and the architecture gave them the freedom to go do those things, and then I gave them the air support to go do that, okay? An example, there's a ton of examples, but the, the one that's just the clearest is the language. My original idea for the language was something very, very simple. Uh, Bruce Payette and Jim Truer got together and they produced the language spec and it's at least 10 times more powerful than anything I had ever visioned. And those guys just hit a home run and they deserve all the credit. I mean just, and then Lee Holmes on the security and the, some of the namespace stuff. You just lots of individual team members, too many to name, have been able to take this and, and bring their own creativity. Now. As an editor, I go in there and edit. It's like, no, not that, like this. But I've been able to harness the, you know, just some great people doing great work uh, because I wasn't too specific. If I was very specific, then it's got to be this way. So actually, that's probably the thing I'm most proud of is getting that right. Getting that right. So the Monet Manifesto really said, I mentioned we we're going to deconstruct the model and do it differently and focusing on economics. So there were brand new approaches. Uh, building the commands, we wanted to, again, focus in on the smallest amount of work individual developers had to write and get the maximal benefit. Composing solutions to these object pipelines, have new management models, and then layer GUIs on top of PowerShell. Now this Monad optimization model was really just <laughs> Uh, I like to say optimized for <laughs> developers significantly disconnected from the reality of running their own systems. It's one of the things now I say I'm most optimistic about Microsoft because so many of our teams now are running their own software. I mean, when you don't run your own software, right, when you're, when you're just like, it used to be that somebody would write code and they'd check it in. Sometime later, someone else would compile it. After that, somebody else would test it. After that, somebody else would package it up, put it on a CD-ROM. Somebody else would sell it to a customer. The customer would have a problem, so they'd call somebody else, who'd then manage that. All the time, the guy who checked in the code like, man, I'm a rock star. I'm off to do it again. It's like, well, wait, wait. Where's the feedback loop, right? And that, that, that broken system is why you end up with things like a general error occurred. Right? Do you ever get that error message? A general error occurred. You know what that means? That means that what that literally means is, ooh, I ran into a problem, but it's it's five o'clock, and I only got about an hour. Otherwise, I'm gonna be late for dinner. General error occurred. <laughs> home, home, home for dinner. No, I'm not joking. That's the joke, right? I said error messages are what happens when programmers stop pro programming, right? Anyway, so, but that was the reality we had. And so, you know, these guys didn't know, uh, just made a lot of, they were just completely disconnected from the systems. By the way, that, and I mentioned that one of the things I'm so optimistic about is that the teams are starting to run their own software and you really see it. The error messages are getting better, people are writing diagnostics, et cetera. In fact, our new CEO, Satya, said, I don't know, there's something, uh, something um, some phenomena going on. It just turns out that when I put a pager on a developer's belt, I get better software. Not sure what's going on there. And he's absolutely right. Anyway, so what's that mean? Uh, so this model was based upon that, heavily influenced by Jeffrey Moore, Michael Porter, and value theory. Again, kind of economic and strategy. So, and by the, the compositional model. And um, I used to be a Unix development manager. And at some point, I just flipped the bit on that community and said, oh, you guys are a bunch of jerks, and then switched to the Windows community. And so what, what was it? And it was a bunch of things, but it culminated one day when one of my developers came to me. We had just got the latest drop from OSF of the latest bits, and he said, look at this code. And I said, okay, what's the matter? And it was send mail, and it got to a certain part of the code, and there was an error condition, and it printed, it did a printf puke monkey guts, Abort. I thought, <laughs> oh my God. You know, and this is after triple panic aborts and all that. And I thought to myself, oh my God, you know, it's a culture where clever and funny 
trumps like trying to help the user. Like clearly they weren't trying to help the user. And that just pissed me off. And by the way, I was, I was part of that, right? I used to write code that, you know, by the way, with the original Unix editor had exactly one error message, question mark. And we prided ourselves like, hey, if you're not dumb enough to figure, if you're dumb enough you can't figure out your own pro errors, you shouldn't be using Unix, right? And so I would write code that was almost sort of intentionally hard. To, you, know, you couldn't use it? Yeah, because I'm smarter than you. It's just stupid mindset. Anyway, I rejected that mindset and said, hey, I want to help people be successful with their jobs. And that was a very deep thought throughout the, the entirety of this. Now, it turns out that there are some systems out there that do this very well. IBM's AS400 and digital, uh, digital equipment's uh, VMS DCL are, are excellent examples of this. And so I wanted to be more production oriented, right? By the way, that's why you have dash what if, VMS DCL, dash confirm, VMS DCL. Ubiquitous wildcards, actually IBM started to do that a bit, uh, not to the degree to which we did. There you go, VMS DCL. And Tickle, Tickle had a wonderful architecture. Uh, by the way, I'm just being clear here, I'm giving credit where credit